Alaska of Alaska Wilderness League, Amy Gulick, to share her latest book, The Salmon Way. Amy will take us on our travels throughout Alaska to explore the web of human relationships that revolve around these extraordinary fish. Commercial fishermen took Amy on his crew. Alaska Native families taught her the art of preserving fish and culture. And sport fishing guides showed her where to cast her line as well as her mind. Mm -hmm. um, everywhere shared their salmon riches with Amy in their kitchens, their cabins, and their fish camp. After all, it's the salmon way. Along the way, we learned that salmon are so much more than fish. They can connect people to a place, a community, and to each other. And with that, I'd very much like to welcome tonight's speaker, Amy Gulick. Well, hi there, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here again. Thank you uh, so much to the Alaska Wilderness League for uh, inviting me and for hosting this Geography of Hope series. Uh, and a big, big thank you to all of you for tuning in. I, I certainly know that this is still not my preferred way to connect with all of you. I'd much rather you know, be in person and shake your hands and, and see you and hear you, but, but um, this is still a terrific way to, to connect. And, and again, I'm very grateful that, that you've uh, decided to spend uh, the next hour plus uh, here. Um, listening to wonderful stories about salmon. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I uh, live and work on the traditional homelands of the Snohomish, Tulalip, and Coast Salish people uh, in the Salish Sea in Washington State. And I thank uh, the indigenous people of this area for stewarding their homelands for thousands of years. I'd also like to acknowledge what has brought us together uh, here tonight, and that's salmon. So I always like to start off my talks by giving thanks uh, to the salmon for helping us connect uh, with one another, because you're going to see that is what salmon are really good at doing. So um, as a writer and a photographer, I tell real life stories. Um, I don't make things up, but how do I decide which stories uh, to pursue? Well, sometimes I, I read something or maybe I have a conversation or an experience that sparks my curiosity. And a number of years ago, um, I had a conversation with an Alaska Native woman um, that I think really got me on the path uh, to starting um, the Salmon Way. And um, I think you just saw, uh, this is a cover of the book. Um, and this was a, a five-year journey um, to uh, go out and meet with folks and gather all these stories and all these images. Um, but I, I could have spent a lifetime uh, working on it because when you sit down with people and you start asking them about um, you know, their relationship to salmon, it's pretty heartening, the stories uh, that come out. So I'm, I'm gonna share a few of those with you. But, but that initial conversation I had um, with uh, uh, the Alaska Native woman, um, there's a short story in the book about that conversation. And I'd like to share, uh, just read a, a small part of it to you uh, now. And before I do that, I'm gonna share my screen so that you can have something to look at other than my head. <laughs> okay, Monica, can you give, just give me a thumbs up? If, Looks uh, great. The, okay, awesome. All right. Stroking a thick white mountain goat hide placed next to a loom, I watched master weaver Terry Rothgar create a robe traditionally made from the animal's wool. Next to the hide are strips of spruce root, raw materials for her exquisite woven basket also on display. Terry tells stories about her Clinket Raven ancestors as her expert fingers weave a beautiful design. And I say to Terry, with such beautiful, I'm sorry, with such plentiful resources in your homeland, it's easy to see how your ancestors thrive. And she stops what she's doing, she puts everything down and she looks at me and she says, resources? Mountain goats and trees aren't resources. We have relationships with the goat and the tree. Since time immemorial, Terry tells me, her people have lived along the forested coast of what is today Southeast Alaska, rich with spruce and cedar trees, mountain goats, salmon, bears, ravens, and eagles. To make items using spruce root and cedar bark, the people carefully harvested the roots and bark so that the trees could continue to live. Today, weavers use the same harvesting techniques. They knew the optimal time of year to hunt the mountain goat, so the animal's coat was in the best condition. 
In addition to mountain goat wool, they also use the hide, horns, and meat. I wonder how Terry's ancestors thousands of years ago had the foresight to harvest bark or roots so as not to kill the trees. The forest must have seemed endless and in a constant state of regeneration in the soggy climate. But this mindfulness speaks to the difference between resources and relationships. When people live with deep connections to the land, water, animals, and plants that sustain them, it's impossible not to respect and develop relationships with trees, goats, salmon, and more. Resources, on the other hand, tend to refer to end products, commodities. It's pretty tough to have a relationship with lumber, copper tubing, or frozen fish sticks. So I think it was really that chance encounter and that brief conversation uh, with Terry about relationships that sparked a lot of questions in my mind. And that's how a story usually starts for me, with questions. So here's a question for all of you. If I asked you what your relationship with salmon is, what would you say? And what kind of a question is that to ask somebody? What's your relationship with salmon? Well, it's the question that compelled me to go to Alaska and to show up at the homes, boats, and fish camps of complete strangers. I was intrigued that there's still a place in this world where the lives of salmon and people are linked. And I wanted to know what are the lives of people, uh, what are they like who have relationships with these remarkable fish? So after several years of asking Alaskans this question, I came back with the stories and photographs that you'll find uh, in the book, The Salmon Way. And I'm gonna highlight just a few of them here today. I do encourage you though, either buy the book, go to the library, get a copy, borrow a copy. Um, there's now uh, an audio book uh, as well um, because there's so many wonderful stories in the book and I only have time uh, to share uh, a few of them. Um, I do want to say I'm very, very grateful to the, all the people who opened their homes and their hearts uh, to me, and they've allowed me to share their stories uh, with all of you. So where to start? And Monica, I'm not able to advance uh, the image. We can do a stop, share, and reshare real quick if that works. Okay. Uh, Oh, hang on there. Okay. Um, is that shared? Can you see the map? Nope, okay. you'll have to reshare, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, folks. You'd, th you'd think we'd all be so good at this, <laughs> but there's always, there's always some kind of technical glitch. All right, can you see the map? We see the, we see the map. <laughs> okay, awesome. awesome. All right, so here is a mind boggling map um, of Alaska. And this documents close to 20,000 streams, rivers, and lakes. They're all shown here in blue, where you can find salmon. Now keep in mind that this number is believed to represent only a fraction of the waters actually used by salmon. These are the ones that have just been officially documented, but there are so, so many more. And keep in mind that Alaska is enormous. Uh, it's more than twice the size of the state of Texas. So I'd like to point out a few places that I'll be talking about today so you can orient yourself. Ah. So again, Monica, the, the, the slides aren't advancing. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. Um, should I stop share again? Uh. Also, Amy, try... Um hitting your space bar and see if that works when you reshare again. Sometimes that helps. Okay, so the space bar to, to advance. Uh, yeah, I think that worked. Okay, so that green area, again, just trying to orient you uh, to different uh, parts of Alaska I'll be talking about uh, today. So the green area that you see there, that is Bristol Bay. That's in Southwest Alaska. That entire watershed that highlighted there that drains into Bristol Bay, that is about the size of the state of Kentucky. Um, oh, sorry. <sighs> yeah, you know, everything was working so great. So space bar doesn't work. Clicking on your screen does not work. No. All right. Do you want to exit out of PowerPoint and restart it? Uh, sure, if you think that'll help. Um, hang on. So, 
Oh, you know, there it goes. yeah, let me see if that, okay. All right. You good? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you're still with me folks. Technical difficulties. We're good. Okay. So you saw the size of Bristol Bay over here. This is uh, Southeast Alaska. Um, Southeast Alaska is about the size of the state of West Virginia, and it contains uh, important transboundary rivers, the Taku, the Stikine, and the uh, Unic uh, River. And when I say transboundary, I mean that they originate in Canada, in British Columbia here, and they drain into the United States through Alaska. Okay, rocking and rolling here. <laughs> so over here, this is known as the uh, Yukon Kuskokwim River Delta. That delta alone, this is where both the Yukon and the Kuskokwim rivers drain. Um, just the delta all by itself is one of the largest in the world. Um, and, the, uh, and it's about the size of the state of Louisiana. And it's important to note that the Yukon River, uh, which uh, is one of the rivers that drains into there, that's the third long, uh, longest river in North America. It's 2,000 miles long. It's also transboundary, originates in Canada, drains through um, Alaska. Um, so what you can't, so when I look at this map, I mean, what I see is a living landscape, uh, this beating heart whose arteries of life are all those blue waterways. What you can't see on that map, though, are all the salmon pulsing through those waterways, bringing life to bears, birds, plants, people, and communities. Everywhere I went, Alaskans told me that salmon are their lifeblood. So for those of you who may not be familiar with salmon and their life cycle, um, very briefly here, they start their lives in fresh water. Um, they look like this uh, when they're just um, starting their life. Um, they head out to the ocean to mature. And then if all goes well, they return to their freshwater birth streams as adults to then spawn the next generation. And then they die. That is the life cycle of Pacific salmon. So in between the beginning and the end of their lives, uh, a lot can happen. And at the end of their lives, they pass something on to the next generation. Not unlike us, right? In between the beginning and the end of our lives, a lot can happen. And what do we pass on at the end of our lives? Can salmon teach us something about ourselves? So when you start poking your nose into people's relationships, you never know what you might learn. In the native village of Napaimute, I poke my head inside the low doorway of a smokehouse. It's dim with a smoky haze, but the bright orange flesh of salmon illuminates and fills the space. Shelly Leary is hanging salmon strips on double hung racks. And she tells me, I was taught to always be ready to have food for the winter. I feel poor when I don't have, when I don't have food put up. And when the smokehouse is filled, I feel good because I know I have enough. So it's mid-June and among the season's first salmon, we speak in lowered voices, respectful of the bounty before us. The aroma of smoked fish permeates my skin, clothing, and the pleasure center of my brain. I feel a great sense of comfort here, and I'm not really sure why. Never having to think much about where my food comes from or the possibility of its scarcity, how could I begin to understand Shelley's feeling of well-being that comes with a full smokehouse? So we're on the Kuskokwim River. This is 255 miles upstream from its mouth. And the village population here of less than 100 is seasonal, with most people, including Shelley's family, arriving when the salmon do. The rest of the year, she lives downriver in Bethel, population 6,000, accessible only by airplane or boat. So Shelley tells me a story of when she was in Seattle for a few days. A friend from Alaska was with her, and they walked around the big city looking at all the tall buildings and the crowds of people. And she says, we wondered what all of those people would do when something bad happened. What would all of those people eat? We were glad we were going home soon. And this is home for Shelly. This is just a very small postage stamp of that massive um, Yukon Kuskokwim River Delta. So that's the difference between my and Shelly's comfort derived from her full smokehouse. Mine is immediate gratification, delicious food and a warm, cozy place right now. Hers is long-term security, food for the winter, like money in the bank. I live under the delusion that there will always be food, even though I'm not growing, fishing, hunting, or storing it. Shelly lives under no such pretense. So who is the wiser? Who is rich? How do we define wealth? 
Shelly is Ingalik. She's an Alaska native and she and her family are among the 18% of Alaskans considered subsistence users of Alaska's fish and wildlife. Now for thousands of years, Alaska natives have fished, hunted, gathered as a way of life. Today, approximately 130,000 rural residents, both natives and non-natives, still rely on fish and wildlife, harvesting on average close to 300 pounds per person a year, and fish account for more than half of this amount. It's really important to note, there's really no other place in the United States that's wild and abundant enough that a significant number of people can still live this way. So most of us are thousands of years removed from the ways of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. So today's concept of subsistence in Alaska, it's often misunderstood. The word subsistence itself uh, implies a meager existence, but most Alaskans who live this way of life um, told me that they consider themselves rich people and they fight hard to maintain the right to continue their customary and traditional ways. Now, an outsider like me could see this as a food security issue, but I've come to learn that it is much more than that. It's about people whose identities, cultures, and connections to the land, waters, their ancestors, elders, children, and each other revolve around fishing, hunting, gathering, sharing, and respecting food and where it comes from, and teaching the next generations to do the same. Salmon bring people together. They keep people together. Three generations of this family gather at their fish camp on the Kuskokwim River. So let's meet another family, uh, this one from Juneau in Southeast Alaska, whose three generations gather because of salmon. So Heather Hardcastle, she's standing there in the middle with the yellow suspenders. Heather tells me that her fondest childhood memory is riding in a skiff in the long twilight of an Alaska summer evening with salt spray and the smell of spruce trees in the air. The boat whisked her to see spawning salmon near the Taku River, one of those transboundary rivers in Southeast Alaska. And she tells me, I'll never forget the joy I felt dragging my hands through the water, touching the backs of all those beautiful fish as sheer granite peaks towered over us. So Heather's parents, she, um, Pete and Sheila, they're there on the left. They fished the Taku River and sold salmon commercially in the summers. And they brought young Heather, her brother and the family dog along on their boat. Uh, name for Heather. And uh, Heather tells me that she grew up eating salmon every day in every way. So baked, boiled in burgers, salads, and even salmon pie. And it wasn't until she left Alaska to attend college in North Carolina that she fully appreciated the abundance of salmon that still exists in her home state and the way of life it allows commercial fishermen to live. Heather's husband, Kirk, is sitting in front of her with their daughter, uh, Kieli. And uh, Kirk grew up in California, uh, Northern California, um, in a culture that revolves around high quality locally produced cuisine. So when he uh, married into Heather's family and he began to fish commercially with Heather's dad, he quickly saw the potential uh, to bring superb fish directly to restaurants, uh, speci specialty markets and consumers who want that direct connection with food and, and the fishermen. So together with two friends, uh, Renee and Winston, they're there on the right there with their daughter, uh, Athena, they formed uh, Taku River Reds. This is a company that prides itself on honoring both the fish and the fishermen by providing high quality wild Alaska salmon and supporting a way of life for fishing families. So Heather in her spare time uh, advises an international coalition called Salmon Beyond Borders that works to conserve her home stream, the Taku River, along with those other transboundary salmon rivers that straddle the United States-Canada border. This is the mouth of the mighty Stikine River, uh, one of those transboundary rivers. And Heather says, these rivers are our lifeblood. My dad has always said to evaluate any proposed activity or development through the lens of salmon. Whatever is good for salmon is going to be good for the environment, community, and economy. Now, I've been fortunate to spend time with Heather's family sharing delicious salmon, laughter, and hopes for the future. Grateful for the life salmon have given them, Heather and Kirk are raising their daughter Kieli on salmon every day in every way. And yes, that includes salmon pie. And in the long twilight of summer near the Taku River, they ride by skiff to the place where the salmon and their family have always gathered. So for thousands of years, people have always gathered where there are salmon. 
In Bristol Bay in Southwest Alaska, the annual return of the world's largest run of sockeye salmon triggered a great migration of native people who came for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. Today, the migration of both salmon and people continues in Bristol Bay, home for the past century to a thriving commercial fishery. People come for the seasonal bounty and to renew ties with family and friends. Melanie Brown, she's on the left there in red, and she's migrated with her family to Bristol Bay every one of her 50 summers. Melanie is Alaska native. Uh, her ancestors are Yupik, uh, Aleut, and Inupiaq. She inherited her great grandfather's commercial fishing site near the Naknak River. This is one of nine rivers that feeds into Bristol Bay. So there are two ways to commercial fish in Bristol Bay, set netting and drift netting. Melanie is a set netter. So set netters, they fish close to shore from a fixed location and many use skiffs to help them set and then pull in their net. Drift netters, uh, they use bigger boats and they can fish anywhere within the legal boundaries. So they're moving around quite a bit. Now some set netters, um, they don't use boats at all and they fish from the beach. And as one beach set netter told me, most of the time it's plain, hard, miserable work in the cold, in the wind, in the rough waters, in the rain, in the mud, with bugs, little sleep and improper nourishment for days on end. So this Bristol Bay fishery, it is incredibly intense. Why? Well, an enormous volume of salmon pulses into the bay in a very short period of time. Since the 1960s, an average of 33 million fish return every single year. The season I visited, close to 60 million fish return. Now, most salmon runs in Alaska happen over the course of about four to six weeks, but here in Bristol Bay, 80 to 90% of that run comes in just 20 days. So with salmon showing up in mass and limited hours to catch them, it's all hands on deck and sleep isn't something that one can afford uh, to do much. So for Melanie in the middle there, she uh, commercial fishing in Bristol Bay, it's a business, uh, but it's rooted in family. Now her dad captains his own drift boat, her sister family uh, fishes their own set net site, and Melanie and her mother, and her mother there is on the left, and her mother's in her 70s, uh, they fish their two set net sites together. And Melanie's daughter, Mari, on the right there, um, she was 14 uh, the season that I uh, started, um, or that I visited. She had just started uh, to fish with the family. And Melanie tells me, I feel like I'm living a legacy, a continuation of a river flowing in time. The Naknak is my family's home stream, and I'm grateful that it has given us life for so long. I want that to continue for my children and their descendants. So I spent a day on Melanie's skiff watching just how physically demanding set netting can be. Everything on Melanie's boat is muscle powered. There's no mechanical gear, you know, helping to, to bring in this net. And this net all by itself is heavy, and then it gets loaded up with fish, and um, this is really tough work. Um, so they're setting, they pull, they pick the net, they repeat this for six to eight hours. Uh, they try to get some rest in between fishing openings, and then they do it all again the next tide and the next until the season ends. So at the end of the day, uh, Melanie invites me to the family home for a dinner of moose spaghetti, and birthday cake for her eight-year-old son, Oliver, who's down there on the right. And I ask everyone in the family, you know, what does salmon mean to you? The answers come rapid fire. Food, home, family, opportunity, education, blessing, work ethic. And Melanie tells me that when she was young, she started asking fundamental questions. I think questions we all start asking at some point, like what's the meaning of life? You know, why are we here? And she says, there are certain events that mark our lives and at the end, that's it. But there's the hope that we're passing something on too. You look at salmon and how much they pass on, not only to their offspring, but to the whole system that they're a part of and benefit. I think a human who has lived life well does that too. So we've seen how salmon benefit uh, people who catch and sell them for their livelihood and people who rely on them for a substantial part of their diet uh, as well as their culture. And they also benefit people who make a living as sport fishing guides. John Yeager, he's on the right. He lives in Wrangell near the mouth of the transboundary Stikine River in Southeast Alaska. So he takes people on his boat to fish for salmon in the ocean. And he says, I'm not, my, I'm not so much trying to fill the freezers of my clients. I'm trying to fill their minds with memories. 
There are many firsts on my boat. First time in Alaska, first time catching a salmon, or first time fishing with a grandchild. I like that I can provide experiences that will stay with people forever. So John grew up in a small town in Ohio and his family owned a grocery store. And he tells me that when he was young, if he wanted ice cream or T-bone steaks, he'd just go to the family store and grab what he needed. There was no exchange of money and he never really understood where food came from or what it took to get it. But when he came to Alaska, he married into a family that homesteaded on the Stikine River and fishes and hunts as a way of life. And he says, Living the way we do in Alaska, I think a lot about food, especially salmon. When my family catches a salmon, we give some to my wife's parents and to an elderly neighbor, and then we share the rest together. We've done the job the fish wanted us to do with it. That's important. It's not just the sustenance of the fish, it's the spirit of the fish. Heidi Wild, she's shown here with her 14-year-old son, Lane. Uh, she's a sport fishing guide in Bristol Bay. She takes clients all over this immense region to fish for salmon and trout. She guides March through October. And so she sees salmon at both the beginning and end of their lives. And she says, the moment that salmon eggs hatch, the fight to survive and thrive is on. The fish make their way to the ocean and they face limitless perils. They stay gone until they're called home. They don't quit swimming in the middle of their return home simply because they faced obstacles. They keep moving forward, tirelessly, devoted, inspiring, just like most of us. So Heidi, myself, and two others, we fly in a small float plane soaring over the vast tundra with its countless creeks, lakes, and rivers. It's late August, and while the frenzy of the Bristol Bay commercial fishing season for people ended in mid-July, the frenzy of the spawning season for salmon is in full swing and the many tributaries upstream from the mouth of the bay. The pilot lands on a lake and we hike to a creek jammed with tomato red sockeye nearing the end of their lives. But we are not here for the salmon. We are here because of salmon. Rainbow and Dolly Varden trout grow big and fat here, feasting on salmon eggs, salmon carcasses, and the young salmon that emerge in the spring. So we cross the creek and a wall of crimson sockeye opens and streams along both sides of us. The water sings with the riffles of the shallows and the ripples of the salmon swaying in the current. We cast into the water, into our minds, fishing for whatever this way comes. Few words are exchanged. The shared connection to the land, the fish, and the crisp air bonds us together better than words ever could. Time slows. What matters is what's happening now, not what happened years ago or what might happen tomorrow. Heidi peers toward the bank of the creek and she says, is that a bear? My inner calm is disrupted by her voice, but all that matters is what's happening now. And what's happening now is that a bear has become between our group. Um, this is not an ideal scenario. You know, it's something we were so careful to avoid for most of the day. He creeps into the creek and he turns broadside to us. This is a polite and rather effective way of intimidating his neighbors by showing us his size. So we give the bear space and he ambles upstream a little ways, stops and turns broadside again. I think maybe he's trying to tell us that we've overstayed our welcome in his dining room. So we clump together and we splash across the creek, salmon bodies thrash against our legs, our boots hit dry ground, and we begin to scramble up a steep bank, bashing through a wall of willows. Finally, we reach the top. And then the laughter begins. Laughter at the bushwhack of the bank, laughter at ourselves for fleeing the scene, and laughter because it's exhilarating to be in this staggeringly beautiful place, sharing this world-class moment with new friends. So bears and salmon go together, and so do many other species that salmon benefit. At every stage of their life cycle, salmon are a life force that feeds something. The salmon circle of life radiates to support at least 50 different species in Alaska. You spend time around salmon and you realize that they're in everything. They're in bears, birds, marine mammals, and people. They're even in trees. Now, I hope you're scratching your heads and asking, how does this happen? And those of you who saw my presentation in the last year, Salmon in the Trees, you may already know. But in case you don't know, I'm going to give you a little crash course here because it's quite fascinating. So salmon in the trees. Is this, is this salmon in the trees? Well, no, technically this is salmon up a tree. So how the heck does salmon get in the trees? 
Well, in the great salmon forests of the Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska, scientists have found high concentrations of a nitrogen variant in trees near salmon streams. This variant is called nitrogen 15 and it comes from the ocean. So how did it find its way from the sea into the forest? Well, it swam there in the bodies of spawning salmon loaded with marine nutrients from their time at sea. But how exactly then does it get into the trees? Well, bears have a lot to do with this. Now, bears don't particularly like being around other bears. So when they catch a fish, they'll often carry it away from the stream and into the woods. Turns out that bears can move a lot of salmon into the forest. Researchers say that one bear can carry 40 fish from a stream in eight hours. In Southeast Alaska, there are 5,000 spawning streams. There's millions of wild salmon and there are some of the highest densities of both brown and black bears in the world. So you do the math, that adds up to a lot of salmon dragged and dropped uh, into the forest. Now, toward the end of a good uh, salmon season, the bears can afford to be picky and they're usually targeting just the richest parts of the fish and they leave the rest behind. Other animals scavenge on these carcasses and this spreads the nutrients farther throughout the forest. Well, guess what happens? All of this rich fish fertilizer decomposes into the soil and the trees and other vegetation absorb it through their roots. Scientists have actually traced nitrogen 15 in trees near salmon streams that links back to the fish. And that is how salmon end up in the trees. Now, how cool is that? Well, it's so cool. I did an entire book on this topic called, what else? Salmon in the trees. Now for this book, The Salmon Way, a lot of people have asked me how I made this cover photo. So this is real, this is not Photoshop. I did not doctor this in any way. So I had this idea in my mind that I wanted to make a photograph that spoke to the concept of salmon as a life force. But this is really difficult to capture and show when the salmon are still alive. So somehow I needed to make a photograph of a live, vibrant salmon providing life for something else. Now to do this, I went to McNeil River on the northeast side of the Alaska Peninsula. There's a story in the book about my time here and I'd like to read just a part of it to you now. And if, I don't know if anybody you can hear, but it is absolutely per, uh, torrential <laughs> raining here at my house. So I'm hearing a lot of uh, noise on my roof. I hope that, I hope that you can still hear me. Yes, it, we can. <laughs> okay, it's gonna last a little while. <laughs> so uh, here's the story. Weighing more than half a ton, a bear named Rocky ambles toward me. He has scars on his face and shoulders and tattered skin on his sides. He's a fighter, hence his name, and he's healthy. His belly almost scrapes the ground. His enormous head melds into his massive girth and each paw is bigger than my head. He's hungry. Fortunately for Rocky and me, there's a river full of fish, just steps from where he stands and I sit at the McNeil River State Game Sanctuary. Established in 1967, the 200 square mile sanctuary is protected wildlife habitat and home to the world's largest congregation of brown bears, also known as grizzly bears. As many as 144 individuals have been identified in a single summer uh, with 74 bears observed at one time. From early July through mid-August, chum salmon return to the McNeil River to spawn. A mile upstream from the river's mouth, the McNeil River Falls create a salmon traffic jam, providing excellent fishing opportunities for bears and outstanding bear viewing experiences for humans. That's why I'm here, along with nine other lucky homo sapiens who won four-day bear viewing permits in a lottery system through the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Now, if it weren't for salmon, we wouldn't be here. If it weren't for salmon, people who came to McNeil long before it was designated a wildlife sanctuary probably wouldn't have been here either. The camp where we pitched our tents is pocked with shallow depressions in the ground. This is evidence of semi-subterranean dwellings of people who were most likely nomadic. I can envision them arriving in the summer to harvest salmon. Perhaps they took steam baths fueled by driftwood from the beach not far from today's wood-fired sauna overlooking a lily pond. They would have shared food, chores, and laughter, not unlike us sharing peanut butter, hauling water, and swapping stories. While they didn't come here to watch bears, they undoubtedly viewed them with respect. Now everything we do, eat, sleep, walk, and talk is done with respect for the bears and their home. We sit quietly near the roaring river. 
Rocky faces the falls and solid defiance of the oncoming water tumbling over the boulders and swirling past his legs. He darts his head into the churning water and emerges triumphant with a flopping fish. It's a female, and as the clamp of the big Bruin's teeth forces the eggs from her body, in that moment, her life force is transferred to his. Watching this age-old scene of predator pursuing prey in a setting devoid of roads, motorized vehicles, crowds of people, or cell phone coverage triggers something deep within us. That wild part of our DNA, long dormant, awakens from its domesticated slumber. Places like the McNeil Sanctuary make us feel alive, not because we're seeking a thrill, but because what we didn't know we were missing reintroduces itself, connecting to our true nature makes us whole. So, hang on. <laughs> so I, I think that many people uh, are drawn to salmon. I know that I am because in salmon, we see a bit of ourselves. Salmon show all who encounter them that life is this dance of rhythms, balance, and strength through twists and turns, ups and downs. We learn to trust the unseen and bow with grace for the time we are here. From the fish, we learn what it means to be a part of the world, what it means to be human, what it means to be. Salmon are a gift. I heard that everywhere I went too. They're a gift to the land, water, animals, plants, and people. And when you're on the receiving end of a gift, you give thanks and you give back. It's the salmon way. Now, everywhere I went, from remote villages to urban cities, whether I met with people for 10 minutes or 10 days, I always seemed to leave with salmon in my hands. I was so touched by the generosity that the salmon people showed me. I learned that sharing is the Alaska way and that it goes beyond food and it includes sharing things like firewood, laughter, sweat, and tears. This generosity of spirit forges relationships and relationships create communities. Now, throughout my travels, I asked uh, everybody another question. What would your life be like without salmon? Everyone pretty much gave me the same answer. Without salmon, there would be no community. So that's what salmon do. They connect us to each other, to a home stream and to our true nature. Emma Lakaitis, she's a young commercial fisherman from Homer and she says, Salmon have given all Alaskans a common language, a set of values, something to believe in and hope for. Reuben Hasting, he's a young Alaska native sport fishing guide from Bristol Bay, and he says, watching salmon, you see that life isn't just a straight line that ends at the finish line. Both Emma and Reuben hope that their generation and beyond can continue the salmon way of life. Now, for many Alaskans who don't make their living from salmon or live a subsistence way of life, their connection to salmon still runs deep, catching their own fish and sharing that bounty with others because food always tastes best when it's shared. Now, I wish more than anything uh, that I could live the salmon way of life where I live in Washington State's Salish Sea. And if I was born 80, maybe 100 years ago, I might have been able to. So. When I look at this map, I feel both pain and hope. So much of the hope lies north um, in Alaska, but let's talk a little bit about the pain first. So the one staggering runs of salmon in Northern California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Southern British Columbia today are now less than 10% of their historical abundance. How did this happen? Well, beginning in the late 1700s, an increasingly industrial way of life systematically decimated salmon and their habitat, creek by creek, river by river. A culture that valued short-term profits and commodities dominated cultures that valued long-term relationships with their natural communities. Damming rivers to power factories and energy grids, dumping toxic waste into waterways, diverting water from rivers to irrigate crops, overfishing and deforestation. These are just a handful of crimes against salmon that led to their demise. Now, plenty of people objected to this, but the voices of those who stood for salmon were steamrolled. When the salmon vanished, entire ways of life went with them. The gift of salmon was gone and the relationships and communities and cultures uh, were mostly lost. So this is the Columbia River, uh, 66 miles from its mouth along the border of Washington and Oregon. The 1200 mile Columbia River, this was once one of the greatest salmon producing systems on earth. 
Now, like many of the lower 48 rivers where salmon once thrived, we lost salmon in the Columbia due to overharvest, habitat destruction, hydroelectric dams, and substituting hatcheries for habitat. So at, a, at 146 miles from the mouth of the Columbia, uh, this is, um, or I'm sorry, it is that Bonneville Dam, but at the dam's visitor center, there's an exhibit uh, that talks about dam construction and what it brought to the region. That one sign in that exhibit in particular really stood out to me. Um, so what is wealth, living and happiness? And, and who decides this? You know, the native people whose entire way of life was connected to this free flowing river who gathered for millennia for the seasonal bounty of salmon and to renew ties with family and friends. How would they define wealth, living and happiness? When we overfished, dammed and polluted the mighty Columbia River, we traded one form of wealth for another we traded ways of life for another. And we may have gained, but we also lost. Um, I, I always feel that a river without its salmon is a river without its soul. And this story has repeated itself most everywhere in the world where there were once salmon both on both sides of the Pacific and the Atlantic oceans. So let's talk about hope. So you've seen how the salmon people of Alaska define wealth, living and happiness a full smokehouse, a connection to a home stream and community, gathering with family and friends and sharing the seasonal bounty and passing all of this on to the next generations. There is a strong belief among Alaska natives that if they respect the salmon, the fish will come back every year and give themselves to the people. I think that's the basis for any healthy relationship, respect. If we want these salmon relationships to continue, we have to continue to respect salmon and give them what they need. And what they need is clean, cool, healthy, fresh water to spawn and rear and a thriving ocean to mature. By the way, we need those things too. So I'd like to highlight uh, just a couple people uh, who are working to ensure that salmon have a future in Alaska. Sue Mogger, she's a stream ecologist uh, and the science director for Cook Inlet Keeper. This is an organization that works to conserve the Cook Inlet watershed uh, in Alaska and all the life it supports. Um, in 2008, Sue and Cook Inlet Keeper, they coordinated a team of state and federal agencies as well as nonprofit and community groups to create and implement a stream temperature monitoring network uh, in the Cook Inlet watershed. Um, they've expanded this um, to uh, do this kind of work uh, in Bristol Bay and uh, other parts uh, of Alaska as well. So, so why are they monitoring uh, stream temperatures? Well, as cold-blooded creatures, salmon depend on the water temperature of their environment for the regulation of their body temperature. And Sue helped me understand that what happens to, what happens to fish um, when water temperatures rise uh, something that uh, occurred in the summer of 2019 with record temperatures throughout the entire state of Alaska. And it's something that we might see a lot more of in the future uh, with a changing climate. So she told me that water temperatures above 55 degrees Fahrenheit, this uh, brings increasing stress to salmon. Above 68 degrees, the fish are uh, less likely to avoid predators and successfully spawn. And at 77 degrees and higher, they don't have the energy to spawn and survive the freshwater phase uh, of their life. So there are streams that are already um, at that critical uh, temperature of 77 and higher. So they're monitoring the stream temperatures in order to understand which streams across an entire landscape are prone to warming and which are likely to remain unchanged. This will help um, land managers, salmon managers, prioritize conservation strategies to increase the resiliency of salmon uh, to a changing climate going forward. This is critical, critical work. Um, Ted Otis, he's on the left. He's a research biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Now I spent time uh, with him and other folks within the department to get an idea of, of how they manage salmon. I have no idea, you know, how do you, how do you manage fish? And um, in the course of my time with Ted and others, I learned just how much information and data is behind any decision to allow or restrict any kind of fishing. So things like fish forecasts, test fisheries, escapement reports, genetic analyses, historical records, and, and much, much more. And Ted helped me understand that Alaska still has abundant 
uh, salmon runs, largely because the habitat remains fairly intact. He also stressed how important uh, something called genetic diversity is to salmon. And he cited Bristol Bay as an excellent example um, of diverse salmon habitat that fosters stability within and across salmon populations. Um, this helps make them more resilient to any kind of changes in their environment. So the time I spent throughout the state with the men and women of Fish and Game uh, made me realize that they often work in challenging, often very dangerous conditions. And it can be a very thankless job uh, at times, um, no matter what decision they make, someone's not happy with it. Uh, but everyone I met who does this work, they were passionate about making sure that Alaska is a place where there will always be salmon to catch. And in fact, Alaska is one of the few places left in the world where salmon can still thrive, where salmon people live connected to the fish with an appreciation for what nourishes both body and spirit. And while I set out to tell stories in my book that celebrate the salmon way, there is also a cautionary tale to tell. Bristol Bay, home to the world's largest run of sockeye salmon, is threatened by the proposed pebble mine. If built, it will be the world's largest open pit gold mine situated at the headwaters of two of the most important rivers that feed into Bristol Bay. The transboundary rivers in Southeast Alaska, um, these are threatened by pollution from current and proposed uh, Canadian mining uh, operations uh, upstream. And in some parts of the state, there are salmon runs that are in decline, including uh, those of the Kuskokwim and Yukon rivers for reasons that aren't entirely clear. And there are always new proposals to dam, dredge, and degrade more salmon ha habitat, including building new roads in the Tongass National Forest in Southeast Alaska. These are those great salmon forests that, uh, where there are salmon in the trees. But here's the good news. Alaska is a place where history doesn't have to repeat itself, where salmon still endure, where we have an incredible opportunity to leave a salmon-filled legacy. Now, throughout my travels, I asked everyone I met how he or she values salmon. Not a single person responded with financial figures. Instead, all of the answers spoke to the relationship instead of the resource. And it didn't matter if the people I asked the question to fish for their food, livelihood, or fun. Everyone gave me the same answers. Family, community, culture, well-being, and way of life. These are values too precious to reduce to dollars and cents and senseless to try. So to me, the message was loud and clear. The true worth of salmon, priceless. So today is worth celebrating and defending that Alaska is still a place where salmon are the lifeblood, where the salmon way is still a way of life. And so I dedicate this talk and my book to the salmon people. May your lives always pulse with the beauty and mystery of your home streams. And to the salmon, may you always come home. And to all of you, I leave you with the greatest lesson that salmon have taught me. Life's short, be a life force with the time you're given and give it everything you've got. Thank you. Wonderful, Amy, no, thank you. Um, your stories, your photos, they always, they just take me and I know everyone else who's able to join um, just on um, such an incredible adventure, so. We appreciate it, yes. And I see everyone applauding. Um, <laughs> so I know I did mention we're gonna do Q&A with Amy here in a minute. So please feel free, I saw some questions come in, which is great. But beforehand, I wanted to turn it over to my colleague, Ariel, to share how you can get engaged with us as we work on these and other issues. Thanks, Monica. I will share my screen now. All right. Thank you so much to Amy. Um, I am Ariel Baker. I'm our annual giving manager here at Alaska Wilderness League and part of the fundraising team. So uh -huh. Amy has shared some beautiful photos and some really important reasons why protecting wild Alaska is so important for salmon and ultimately for the people that who depend on these lands. 
And so I just wanted to explain how you can get involved with Alaska Wilderness League to support our efforts to conserve these very special places. First is to take action. So Amy did explain that the biggest threat to the Tongass National Forest, which is of course one of the most vibrant places for where salmon live, is the um, building roads and clear cutting of old growth trees. So recently the Biden administration announced its intent to restore roadless rules protections for the Tongass National Forest that were stripped by the previous administration. While the Biden administration can restore the roadless rule to the Tongass, Congress must act in order for roadless protections to become permanent. So today we are hoping that you can take action by urging your representative to co-sponsor the Roadless Area Conservation Act. You can do so by using the link on the slide and Lois is also going to put it in the chat. Next is to make a donation. Alaska Wilderness League's work is only possible through supporters, many of whom I've seen on the call tonight, so thank you. But I hope that you will make an additional donation tonight. Your donations fund our work in the courts, in the corporate boardrooms, as well as through educational programs like the one we had this evening. As you've heard today, now is such a crucial time to creating lasting protections for Alaska. So I hope that you will join us and give generously today. The link is right on the slide and also Lois is going to be putting it in the chat. Finally, one more way to engage with us is to follow us on social media. Um, our social media handles are all included right on the slide, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is a really great way to just stay up to date with everything going on with Alaska Wilderness League. We promote matching gift campaigns. We share action alerts that we hope you'll get involved with. And we also share beautiful photos. I know that I personally really love following Alaska Wilderness League on Instagram to see photos of the amazing places that our team is working so hard to protect that I know you also really care about. So with that, I just wanted to thank Amy for her incredible partnership throughout many years. And now I will turn it over to she and Monica for questions. Thank you, Ariel. And yes, um, Instagram will be a bright spot in everyone's day if you're looking for um, a, a little daily virtual trip to Alaska. Um, yeah, and again, I, I second Amy, please feel free to, to type any questions into the chat. And I second Ariel, thank you all. Um, I do see so many familiar names and have seen so many familiar faces. Continued support and joining us um, on these and many other programs. So. First off, Amy, I was really moved by how your book and your stories um, really highlighted three critical areas, but very different areas of Alaska, from Bristol Bay to the Tongass to the Yukon Delta. And so being able to see and experience all those, I wanted to start off by asking how your time in Alaska and throughout these different regions and with salmon people really made you look at your own relationship with nature, especially growing up in the Northwest, as you mentioned? Oh, wow, great question. Um, yeah, you know, again, and, and as you mentioned, yes, those areas are so incredibly different from each other, like landscape, um, yeah, the rain, no rain, trees, no trees, or, you know, stunted, kind of a more of a boreal area. I mean, salmon are, salmon are incredibly diverse in the habitats that they can um, inhabit. Um, and, but because those areas are so different, the, the people live fairly different lives as well, um, just because they're all kind of living in different geographies. Um, but again, that, that, common, that common bond that I saw among all people from different parts of the state was you know, salmon and how salmon build community. And I think that's what I was so touched with the most is just um, people, uh, they, they just say, you know, when you, live, when you live in this land of abundance and, and fish just show up, 
like you don't, we don't have to farm them. We're not growing them. We're not chasing after them so much, maybe in a boat a little bit, but, but they, they show up like you're not hurting them. You're not, you know, just, um, they just show up and yeah, there are slow years sometimes, but for the most part, Alaska still in most places still has some pretty healthy salmon runs. Um, so they, they always, again, consider salmon a gift and, and they really talk about that. You know, and I, there's, I've heard it referred to as a gift culture because um, salmon show up, you know, they, they consider that a gift from nature. And so again, when you're on the receiving end of a gift, you, you share, you, you want to share. It's like, wow, here's this abundance. And, you know, I harvested whatever and, you know, oh, elders who maybe can't get out and fish, I'm going to share with them. You know, if family, if there's a family on hard times and they're not able to get out and fish, I'm going to share with them. It's just this, it's a wonderful way to live. Um, and so it really started making me look at my own life you know, here in the Northwest, uh, where I live, where we used to have great runs of salmon. Um, and I, so I started looking, okay, what, what do I have in my life that is uh, rather abundant, um, that maybe I'm not working too hard for, you know, like that I consider a gift. And it was kind of hard to come up with that. Um, because as far as something wild, um, because again, fish are fish are hard here to, to catch in any kind of abundance. But I'm really looking to plants right now, like wild plants. I live in a forest that has an incredible abundance of wild nettles. Um, and there's a lot of things you can do with nettles, you know, nettle tea, um, nettle soup. Um, so I've been kind of on this, uh, uh, again, kind of this mindfulness uh, way of living that salmon have taught me and the salmon people have taught me. So I, when every spring I have an abundance of nettles that show up and I know a lot of people who appreciate them or had never had them, and so I've turned them on to them. I, I sent nettles in the mail this year to people in Alaska who were still having three feet of snow on the ground. You know? <laughs> um, and it's just really cool. You know, the, again, that, that gift culture like that to share something wild. Um, it's, it's really made me appreciate uh, what I do have um, and, and where there are places like Alaska um, where there are things still like you know, wild salmon moose, deer, berries, um, you know, that people uh, very much rely on and, and share. Um, so it's, it, it's just really made me think about that and then try and practice, you know, more, more of this gift culture. Wonderful. Um, I did see a number of questions come in throughout the presentation about Bristol Bay, which is an area you focus on. So I wanted to give a brief update for some folks um, so they know what's going on and then come back and have you share maybe what you learned um, from the folks on the ground there. Um, as Amy mentioned, Bristol Bay is one of the most, if not the most prolific salmon, um, salmon spawning areas uh, that we have. And it was threatened, is threatened by the proposed pebble mine. Um, th this past fall, folks might've heard the Army Corps of Engineers actually denied a clean water permit. And so some were asking earlier in the chat if we were happy and or comfortable with kind of where, where the project is. Um, Another new recent news announcement is that um, an, the Pedro Bay Corp, an Alaska Native Corporation in the region, is working with the conservation um, easement to also hold some of those watersheds in a conservation easement, which is again great news. But I will say, as we've seen over you know decades, even the past few years, um, administrations can change and regulations can change, and also you know Army Corps decisions can change. And so until we see um, a more uh, permanent, more sustained um, level of protection for this critical area. That's what we're going to support um, in terms of for the groups working on the ground and the groups working towards that. Um, but we will take good news when we when we get it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, this has been a long standing issue, and the people, especially of Bristol Bay, were, were have worked very hard and and with a often united front um, to protect their salmon resources. So I didn't know if that had come up at all when you were spending some time up there. Oh yeah, it's, um, yeah. Especially when I was there for the commercial uh, fishing season, you know, all the boats are flying, you know, no pebble mine stickers and pennants and flags and um, you know, wearing no pebble mine hats. I mean, I saw it everywhere. I, th I think there was only maybe one instance where, you know, I saw, something that was apparently for, you know, the mine. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very strong sentiment there. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's kind of crazy, you know, the, 
the argument that is that is always made, you know, by like, like a mining company or really any kind of resource extraction, you know, development is, oh, well, we're bringing jobs. We're bringing jobs to this area. Um, and, you know, in some cases that can be true. I mean, they, they are bringing, uh, you know, they could be bringing jobs to an area that maybe needs jobs or needs some kind of economic development. But Bristol Bay, this is the thing. There are already plenty of jobs there. It's already, this is a thriving, like, you know, not only a commercial fishing uh, industry there, but the sport fishing industry there is, it's huge. Um, you know, sport fishermen, if, if you're a, if you're a fly, a trout fly fisherman, you know, it, it's on every fly fisherman's bucket list, you know, to go to, to Bristol Bay to, to try and catch trout. So it's not like nothing is there. Uh, and, and it's, and it's thriving and it's been thriving for, you know, decades. And, and yeah, people are very proud of, uh, you know, their way of life, um, whether again, and, and you have everything there in Bristol Bay. That's another thing that makes it really interesting. You know, you've got the commercial fishing industry, driving sport fishing industry, and then um, uh, lots of subsistence in all the villages that live along all the rivers and the tributaries that flow into Bristol Bay. So it's a real rich mix of people and ways of life that all revolve around, uh, around salmon. So it's, it's so hard to describe. It's just, there's so much abundance there. It's just, it, it's it's mind blowing. <laughs> yes, and as you mentioned, it's something that um, we've lost most places here in the lower 48. And so, um, yeah, I'm sure even that more uh, impactful when you do see it still in its glory. Um, and now I think the, the other thing we got a lot of questions on was the food aspect, the good aspect, <laughs> yummy, the yummy part of salmon. Um, so one came in and this I think was a very good one. So folks were wondering, how do you know when you're getting wild Alaskan salmon versus farmed? Um, I know I have a very unique experience. As I mentioned, I'm in Southeast Pennsylvania. I'm just about as far as probably you can get from wild Alaskan salmon. And we have a local um, couple that actually fishes in Bristol Bay and brings back wild Alaskan salmon. And I get to go to my farmer's market once a month. I know that is a very unique situation, um, but there are a lot of small purveyors and I know you met with some. So maybe what did you learn about sharing how folks can kind of support the, the wild Alaskan salmon? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I, love, I, love, I love it when people are thinking that way and they're concerned. It's like, hey, I wanna do the right thing. I'm not sure what that is, you know, you know help me out. Um, so there's a the lot to this, but first I would say, you know, there's kind of two things. So wild, wild or farm salmon, um, I personally will never eat a farm salmon if I can help it. I mean, like if I know that it's farmed, I'm, I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to order it. I'm not going to buy it from a market. Lots of reasons for that. Um, uh, just quickly, farm salmon are raised in enclosed net pens in the ocean for the most part. Um, whenever you crowd something like that together, think of like a, a cattle feedlot, you know, where cows are living really close together not a very hygienic, healthy place. And even in water, you know, so you've got all these crowded salmon in these net pens, you know, their waste is filtering down to the bottom, smothering anything below them. Because they're living in these crowded conditions, they're subject to disease. So they might be being fed antibiotics. Um, the thing that makes wild salmon's flesh this beautiful color, like, like I'm wearing here, <laughs> is their wild food. That's what makes their flesh so beautiful. So farm salmon aren't eating their wild food. They're usually eating um, pellets, you know, and ground up other fish that are made into these pellets and who knows what else they're putting into these pellets. So their flesh is a very unsightly gray color. So in order, and if you went to a market and you saw farm salmon and it's gray, probably wouldn't buy it, right? So they dye the, they dye the flesh. So that's another strike against farm salmon, in my opinion. You know, you're eating dye, you're eating maybe antibiotic fed fish. Um, Anyway, it's uh, the good news in Alaska, um, farming of fish is illegal. So no farm fish are coming from the state of Alaska. If, if it says farmed, it could be coming from British Columbia. Um, there's a big, huge movement there to rid British Columbia of uh, farm fish. Could be coming from uh, the North Atlantic, like Scotland, you might see Scottish. And they call it organic too, Scottish organic salmon. It's like, it's farmed. If it's coming from Scotland, it's farm fish. Um, 
any, so anyway, farm versus wild. I always steer people to wild for sure. Now, Alaska, like how do you know you're getting Alaska wild? That can be trickier. Um, I'd like to believe your fishmonger or the, the, the restaurant that's serving it to you. I, I wanna believe that they're knowledgeable. Um, sometimes they're not though. Like, you know, you never quite know. The best way to ensure that you're getting Alaska wild salmon is to make a connection um, with a fishing family. And there are a lot of them now out there now that do this. They directly um, ship salmon to your door. Um, if you go to the website salmonstate.org, um, and I, I think if you look under, I think it's called Marketplace, there's a whole list of Alaska fishermen um, that are doing uh, this, and they'd love to connect with you. The family I mentioned uh, in Southeast that started Taku River Reds, they ship um, fish to you. There's another great company called Sitka Salmon Shares. They will ship wild Alaska salmon and other kinds of seafood to you. Um, that's the best way to ensure you know what you're getting. And it's, and it's great too, because that usually like, you know, the fishermen, it's just like going to your farmer's market, right? And getting, getting carrots or lettuce and looking the farmer in the eye. It's like, you know, you know, you know who, who grew that food for you. And in this case, you know, you'll get a connection to the fishermen and, and their family. And you're supporting, you're supporting that way of life too, which is a really pretty awesome way of life. Awesome, well, thanks for that resource. And Lois just put it in the chat. And as I mentioned, the link we will also be sure to include that in the email tomorrow so you have that. Um, I agree. Yes, Sitka Salmon Shares uh, make great gifts as well, Ariel. Yes. <laughs> um, you'll probably win Christmas or any other holiday um, if you're the giver of one of those um, for the recipient. Uh, and then one last question, because you covered a lot. We had some farm versus wild questions. So thanks for touching on that because I think it is a critical importance uh, for folks to realize. Um, and then kind of towards the end of your talk, you had mentioned about um, the folks doing the work on the ground, essentially, and, and cooking the keepers and the fishing game. And so what did you learn? Um, I know sometimes, especially seeing some images out of Bristol Bay and all the boats and all the nets um, can, can be a little jarring at times. And you're like, this is a sustainable fishery. So what did you really learn in talking with the fishermen and the, the fishing management and about how it is managed. Yeah, again, again, thank you for that question. Another, another great question. Cause I, you know, I didn't know, um, you know, when I started this project, it's like, how do you manage something that's wild? First of all, <laughs> that's in the water, you know, that we can't necessarily see. Um, yeah. And, and how do you prevent what, what happened down here? I mean, part of the, down here where I am in the uh, Pacific Northwest, you know, part of what contributed to our salmon demise was was overfishing. That was one one part of it. So how do you prevent that? And and yeah, like when you go to Bristol Bay in the midst of that commercial season, it's like you just see boats everywhere. And if you can, you don't know this. You're like, oh my gosh, the, the fish don't have a chance. Um, but here's how they do uh, have a chance. So um, and they, they so Fish and Game. Uh, this is the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. They manage um, all. Uh, salmon for the most part. And uh, they manage by escapement. And what that means is uh, when the salmon are, you know, gathering around their, you know, their burst streams, you know, getting ready to leave the ocean and heading back to spawn, um, the fish and game monitors how many fish escape. So meaning escape us, <laughs> basically how many are escaping people? you know, being caught. And they allow so many fish to escape being caught by not allowing fishing. You know, so there are certain days um, they'll say, okay, you know, today, you know, nope, nobody gets the fish. Uh, we need to allow, you know, X number of fish to escape and get up to their spawning grounds. So how do they know, you know, how many fish are getting past and getting through and getting up there? They count, they have counting towers. In Bristol Bay, they've got, you know, people physically in these counting towers. I think it's every hour on the hour and the, no, it's every half hour. It's, anyway, it, it's, it's frequent all day. You've got people counting. Um, and so they can determine, you know, uh, about, they can make a, a fairly good estimate of how many fish are escaping, getting past. And when a certain number get past, um, then they're like, all right, we're going to open it up for, you know, this tide and maybe tomorrow. And then we're going to close it down again for a couple more days or tides, you know, that because the tides are pushing the salmon in. You know, so let more salmon um, get past. Um, 
it seems to work. Um, you know, is, is it perfect? Probably not. But um, that part of it, again, that's the part I was really impressed with just how much information is going into those decisions every single day, whether to allow um, fishing or not. It's, it's really extensive. Um, you know, not only do they know how many fish are going, but they can be out in the ocean. They'll like do some test fisheries, they'll sample fish and they can analyze the genetics. They've got a whole genetic salmon lab in the state. They can analyze tissue samples, send them to that lab. And within, I don't know, it's like 24 hours, they can say, that is a fish that's headed to Knack River in Bristol Bay, or that one's headed to the Quijack, or that one's headed to the Nushagak. Like, like that's how much they know, which is, which is pretty awesome. So it's, it's pretty extensive. So when you do see a ton of boats out there, don't get too alarmed. <laughs> it's, it's there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of science, you know, good science going on behind uh, all these decisions. And I'll say, you know, I mean, fish, commercial fishermen, you know, they make their living catching and selling salmon, but they want to keep doing it too, right? They don't want to just do it for a season and then that's it. And they also want to pass it on to their children if their children want to uh, fish. And so when the decisions get made, you know, to, okay, no more fishing for a while or something, you know, they might grumble, but, but they under, most of them understand and they respect that. And, and a lot of them are actually kind of the eyes and the ears out on the ocean and um, helping fishing game too. You know, like, hey, I'm seeing a mass come in here and they're headed that way. And um, so, yeah, I mean, nobody, no one wants to see what happened uh, down here in the Northwest happen in Alaska. So I, again, I, people understand it and they respect it for the most part. Um, um, well, again, I know we're at 815 and we, uh, as a testament to your, um, <laughs> Your stories and everything, uh, we have not seen many people leave yet. Um, but again, I did just want to thank you, Amy, um, as always, for taking us with you on your adventures um, and sharing your knowledge of what you've learned um, your years on the ground, exploring the salmon way. And again, I want to thank all of you who have tuned in and joined us, um, not only for this episode, but for the 18 previous um, that we've been doing. And which means uh, we will be back with a season three, probably starting early this fall. Um, and we'll be kicking off with episode 20. And you know, it's really important we do these for you. Um, so, you know, again, once we send out the email tomorrow, please don't hesitate if there's something you'd like to see, learn more about, or experience on one of these Geography of Hopes, um, let us know and we will see what we can do because um, we just want to continue to provide a resource um, for all of you and, you know, continue to be able to take you on these amazing adventures with us. So with that, again, I say thank you to all of you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I wish you all a good night. Take care. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>